Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition 2013 webinar series sponsored by Genentech. This evening, the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition and Meals to Heal will be presenting part two of a two-part webinar series, Nutrition on the Fast Track, Creating an Action Plan for the Healthy Living. The webinar will be conducted by College Registered Dietitian Jessica Ayanata, Chief Clinical Officer with Meals to Heal. We're going to wait a couple of more minutes before we begin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition 2013 webinar series sponsored by Genentech. This evening, the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition and Meals to Heal will be presenting part two of a two-part webinar series, Nutrition on the Fast Track, Creating an Action Plan for Healthy Living. We will be starting in the next few minutes. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition 2013 webinar series sponsored by Genentech. This evening, the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition and Meals to Heal will be presenting a part two of a two-part webinar series, Nutrition on the Fast Track, Creating an Action Plan for Healthy Living. The webinar will be conducted by oncology registered dietitian Jessica Ayanata, Chief Clinical Officer with Meals to Heal. Jessica is currently responsible for all clinical operations at Meals to Heal, a complete solution to the needs of cancer patients, evidence-based information, access to credentialed nutritional, nutrition professionals, and affordable delivery of fresh, healthy, well-balanced meals. Jessica, take it away. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to give you some more information tonight and to help you put into practice some of the healthy techniques that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. In order to give people a little bit more time to join, what I thought I'd start with is a brief recap of what we discussed in part one of the web webinar series. 
Some of the techniques we talked about in implementing a healthy cancer-fighting diet and lifestyle include several important key factors. First, we talked about limiting alcohol consumption to one drink or less per day. We discussed maintaining a healthy weight by limiting intake of fatty foods and including more high fiber foods to help control your appetite. We talked about choosing more whole grains, how to look for a whole grain and read a food label properly. We talked about including other high fiber foods like beans and legumes. We also discussed healthy fats outside of animal protein that include things like nuts, seeds, and fish. We also reviewed the importance of exercise and discussed the American Cancer Society's goal of getting at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. And one of my most important facts is eating at least 8 to 10 servings of vegetables and fruits per day of varying colors to try to pack in lots of good, healthy, cancer-fighting phytonutrients. And we also discussed lots of questions and answers related to making educated decisions when choosing a su supplement or perhaps evaluating a food trend that comes up on the internet. So kind of keeping in mind these healthy cancer-fighting diet and lifestyle techniques, what we're going to review tonight is how to create an action plan and create this action plan given these guidelines for healthy living. Okay, so these are some of the things we're going to review tonight. How can we be successful in maintaining our, these good nutritional habits given the wealth of things that we're exposed to every day in terms of convenience and time limitations and things that get in the way of being healthy? Tonight we're going to discuss how to be supermarket savvy and make really healthy decisions when you're shopping in the supermarket. We're going to talk about how to stock a healthy pantry, how to keep healthy foods around so you have less temptation, how to cook for not only health but also convenience. Obviously, a lot of us have many other factors in our lives that get in the way of being able to really plan and prepare and maintain good, healthy cooking habits. And of course, dining out is a part of everyone's life, but how do you dine out with your health in mind? Okay, so let's start by talking about supermarket smarts. One thing I always tell my patients and clients is it's important to go to the supermarket with a plan, kind of given that, that action plan that we're talking about tonight. One thing you definitely don't want to go to the supermarket is go without a list or an idea of why you're entering the food, food market and what you want to buy. Because if you go in hungry or you go in kind of on a whim, there's more of a chance that you're going to buy things that aren't necessarily as healthy and likely kind of satisfying a craving rather than fulfilling your shopping list and your healthy goals for that week. So most importantly, what we want to stress is buying fresh foods. As we always say, stick to the perimeter of the supermarket. Things like fruits, vegetables, seafood, poultry, and dairy are all going to be around the perimeter and not in the center aisles. Seasonal produce is a great thing to look for because not only does it have the maximum amount of nutrition because it's picked in season and it's being sold to you in the season, but it also can help you control the cost somewhat because chances are, obviously in strawberry season, because they're more available, the cost isn't as expensive. And if you're shopping for the week or shopping several days in advance, think about buying produce a few days before it's ripe, just so that it doesn't spoil and you don't waste your money buying a lot of fresh produce that you're not going to have time to consume. Another great idea, and something that people don't always think about, is utilizing the freezer section. So as much as the perimeter is extremely important to a healthy shopping trip, the freezer section can be really valuable as well. And the reason for that is because you can locate things like frozen fruits, frozen vegetables, frozen um, lean meats and seafoods, things that won't necessarily spoil. So if you're not really sure what your menu is going to be for that week or you, know, you want something that's going to last a little bit longer, frozen fruits and vegetables are actually a really great option. And believe it or not, they can actually have more nutrition than their fresh counterparts. And the reason for that 
is that they're flash frozen at the peak of ripeness. So in fact, that freezing process helps them to maintain a maximal nutrition quality. So if you, someone, let's say, who likes to have smoothies every once in a while, but you don't always have a container of blueberries handy, frozen blueberries would be a great option to keep in the freezer. The same thing with things like fish and, and chicken. You know, obviously we talked about including more fish in our previous webinar, and I kind of mentioned that earlier in my recap. But not everyone necessarily has access to a really great fresh fish market, or you may not necessarily really like the fish that's sold, let's say, at your local supermarket. Well, frozen is a great alternative for that. Um, even in some of the bigger bulk stores um, around the country, you can buy um, kind of like a bulk package of, let's say, frozen tilapia, frozen salmon fillets that are, that are wild, that are healthy, and that you can use as needed and have them stocked in your freezer. Okay, so let's talk about some more savvy shopper sense. So one thing we want to do is buy easy to use plant proteins. And the American Institute for Cancer Research recommends that we follow a more plant-based diet, include more plant foods in our diet because they have so many healthy cancer-fighting properties. So some of these plant proteins include things like seeds, nuts, dried or canned beans, and lentils. And they're easy to stock up on. Even flavorful, fresh, or dried herbs and condiments can help you add more variety to your meals. When we think about shopping for our grains and our carbohydrates, one thing we want to try to look at, and we talked about this a lot a couple of weeks ago, is looking for more whole grains. These whole grains have more dietary fiber and more phytochemicals that help our bodies fight disease. So we kind of want to pre replace the white foods, essentially, if we can. Now, I know some people may be on more fiber-restricted diets or maybe um, dealing with some kind of bowel obstructions or fiber issues, even in the survivorship phase of your, of your treatment. And that's fine. You know, in that case, you can stick with things that are more refined if that's appropriate for you. But when possible, if you can choose whole grains, things like whole wheat pasta, brown rice, quinoa, couscous, barley, and bulgur are all great additions and add more variety to your carbohydrate portion of your menu and your shopping list. Most importantly, make sure to use your label reading skills because a lot of times the front of a package is really designed to lure you in. It's designed to be attractive and look healthy and fresh, but that may be deceiving because that food might not necessarily be all that it's cracked up to be. So it's very important to look at the food label when you're in the supermarket. Really get to know what's in your food. Are there added fats? Are there added sugars? Are there artificial sweeteners, other added colorings and ingredients that you may not necessarily want to buy. So let's talk a little bit of how we can kind of delve into this nutrition label. First thing you want to note is the single serving size. Now this can also be deceiving as well because the serving size in this particular label here says one slice. Chances are this is a piece of bread. So one slice is going to give you all of the nutrition information, let's say, on this, in this particular label. But chances are in your meal, one slice is not necessarily the portion that may, in fact, impact your meal. Two portions or two serving sizes may actually be what you're using in your meal. So you want to keep that in mind because there is a chance that the calories may actually be double. And you might want to choose something, let's say, that's lower in fat, lower in saturated fat, doesn't have as much sodium because you're going to be using more than the serving size. So when you look at total calories per serving, here it says 160. That's going to tell you how many calories in that particular serving size. The part that gets confusing on a food label and that people commonly ask me about is the percent daily value, because the percentages get really confusing. All it's really trying to do is tell you what percentage of that particular nutrient is given this particular food label based on the total amount that's allowable within the day. 
On average, it's based on a 2,000 calorie diet. So for example, this particular label has 10 grams of total fat, which is 15% of the daily value allowable. So kind of, how do you benchmark it? So a good rule of thumb is if you're looking at the food label and you want to choose foods that are lower in a certain nutrient, for example, saturated fat. That's not something that we want to have a lot of because saturated fat is known to not be very healthy for our hearts and promote um, clogging of our arteries and really impact our heart health and our cancer prevention. So if you're looking at lowering saturated fat on a food label, you'd want to look at a percent daily value of five or less. A good benchmark, percent daily value of five or less, means that it's low in that particular nutrient. So you'd see in this particular food label, 11% is kind of high. 10 grams of total fat and 2.5 grams of saturated fat is definitely more than you'd want to pick on a food label. Unless it's something, let's say, obviously, an olive oil or a canola oil has a food label, and that's going to be pretty much all fat because that's it's an oil. So in, in that case, it's a little bit different. But in a food that is a food that has multiple ingredients, you, you would want to look for something a little bit lower. Now, there are ingredients on the food label where we say, you know what, we want to make sure we have a good amount. So dietary fiber, for example, which we mentioned a few times in talking about our whole grains. So when we're looking at dietary fiber, this is an area where we'd want a little bit more on the food label. So a good benchmark for percent daily value to look at on a food label is at least 20%. So in this case, it's less than one gram, so you'd know, OK, this particular food isn't really a great source of dietary fiber. And then when you're looking into the micronutrients, things like vitamin A, vitamin C, iron, and so forth, that's helpful if you're trying to choose a food, let's say, that has more calcium, that might have more iron. You know, if you need foods that are richer in those particular vitamins and minerals, that's where that section can come in handy. So that's kind of a little recap on the food label and to give you some tips on how to maximize the information that you're getting. Now, before we moved on to some other techniques, one thing I did want to throw in, especially since we're in springtime and and during the summer season soon. Something that's really popular around this time of the year is the use of farmers markets, even farm stands and kind of local areas that'll have farmers markets set up on various um, days of the week, let's say um, the town square or maybe even at your office, there's um, access to farmers markets and local produce. And the reason why this is so important is that by having the availability, and, and not everybody has this, and that's okay, but if you do, I kind of want to stress to you that you should take advantage of it because it is a great, great option to either visit a local farmer's market or even join a community-supported agriculture program, which is often abbreviated as CSA. And the benefits of these is that not only are you supporting the local agriculture in your area, but that local produce that you have access to actually also can have more nutrition than the food that you're purchasing in the supermarket. And the reason for that is because the time it takes from the farm to the table is significantly less than the produce that you're finding in the supermarkets. Often the produce in the supermarkets is coming from South America and other countries you know, where um, the supermarkets are accessing and, and getting their distribution. So if you th think about the time it takes, let's say, to travel from South America and then actually sit on your supermarket shelf, is definitely a lot longer than the time it would take from your local farm you know, to get into your house and, and prepare a meal with that produce. So if you have access to a local farmer's market or CSA, and you can use the link mentioned here on this slide, you can actually put in your zip code and locate a farmer's market in your area. So that's a great thing to take advantage of at this time of year because it really can help you have access to foods that have the, the most optimal amount of freshness and the most optimal amount of nutrition. So now that we've talked about some strategies for healthy shopping and healthy techniques to use in the, in the supermarkets, let's talk about kind of 
a healthy refrigerator? How do we know that we're stocking healthy foods at home? And these are some of the things that you want to try to remember. Color is always important. We want to think of fruits and vegetables and our plant foods kind of like the color of the rainbow. We want foods that are rich in color, things like spinach, carrots, berries, strawberries, apples, you know, things that are really good sources of fiber. Even cruciferous vegetables are really, really healthy, especially they're good sources of vitamin C, soluble fiber, and phytochemicals. We want to stock up and use these foods, whether it be fresh or frozen, and use these foods more often and make sure that our healthy fridge um, includes a variety of these colorful plant foods. When we talk about dairy products, and we did discuss this in the first webinar, if at all possible to try to use the lower fat or fat-free version because we don't need the additional saturated fat that comes along in higher fat dairy products. So this includes things like milk, cheese, and yogurt. And for those who are lactose intolerant or have other issues that may limit your use of dairy products, certainly things like soy milk, rice milk, and almond milk are also healthy alternatives as well. And oftentimes they're fortified with calcium and other nutrients to make them almost equivalent to their milk counterparts. And I mentioned a couple of times, yep, definitely including more fish. We all know that's a great goal. But how do you know where to start? So if you can start with once or twice a week and work up to a goal of having a fish meal at least twice a week, that would be phenomenal and a great way to include more healthy fat and lean protein in your diet. Things like wild salmon and tilapia are two really healthy choices. And like I said, getting them frozen is a great way to have it available without having to think of getting to the fresh fish market or even you know, using something that's going to spoil rather quickly. And if you think of also the protein section of your refrigerator, you want to choose leaner meats. For example, rather than buying legs and thighs of the chicken, the breast meat obviously is healthier. The healthier portion, the healthier um, without the skin, and the lower in saturated fat, the lowest in saturated fat. Leg and thigh meat actually has two to three times more fat than the breast meat. So if possible, if you can try to stock up your fridge on more healthy fats, healthy proteins, and lean proteins, that would include turkey breast and chicken breast rather than other parts of the poultry. Here's kind of a little sneak peek of what a healthy refrigerator looks like. And you can kind of see some of the ingredients that we've already talked about. You see the colorful fruits and vegetables in the bottom two drawers. We see some carrots and some peppers, some oranges and some apples and, you know, great variety of, of fruits and vegetables there. And then you even see some fresh herbs on the, the bottom shelf there. And you see um, it looks like there's some grains stacked up in those containers might be couscous or quinoa and some beans, even might be, let's say, a container of, um, let's say, homemade soup or something in some of those storage containers in the middle. It looks like it, this, this refrigerator looks like it even may have a carton of soy milk or pomegranate juice on the door. And then on top, you see some, perhaps some chopped up vegetables that might be used in a salad. I see a container of fresh blueberries. Looks like there's some eggs in there. So this is kind of a, a little sneak peek of what a healthy refrigerator would potentially look like. And even on that drawer, the shelf that's right above the fruit, it looks like there would be um, perhaps some lean meats. There might be some chicken breasts there, turkey breasts, maybe some fish, uh, maybe even a lean sirloin if you're including red meat once in a while. So it's, as you see, this what stands out to me in this refrigerator is that there's a lot of color. Um, it, you, know, you can definitely see the plant foods are represented in this refrigerator and that there's not a lot of packaged foods. There's not a lot of foods that contain extra additives and preservatives and sodium and unnecessary ingredients that we don't need. So just kind of a good little snapshot of what a healthy refrigerator can look like. So outside of a refrigerator, we also usually have a pantry or cabinets where we keep non-perishable foods as well. So what are some of the things that we want to consider when we're stocking a healthy pantry? 
Well, as I discussed earlier, some of the meat substitutes and plant proteins are really great to have around things like dried beans, peas, lentils, or tofu. These are great to have around because they're not only good sources of protein and good sources of phytonutrients, but you know, they're also really easy to use if you're ever you know, trying to include more of a plant-based meal. Believe it or not, a one cup serving of something like cooked beans, peas, or lentils can actually replace a two ounce serving of meat, poultry, or fish. So it's a great way to kind of include more plant foods, even you know, that the campaign of Meatless Mondays where um, you, know, you try to include more of a plant-based meal on a Monday that's a great thing to stock up in your pantry to try to achieve that goal. Also nuts and seeds, usually a serving is about a third of a cup or you can think of approximately the size of your palm. You do want to make sure that you choose nuts and seeds that are not roasted and salted because the true benefit is the actual whole healthy nut and seed itself. When you start adding salt and oil to roast it, it actually decreases the value, the health value of that particular food. And of course, choosing more healthy oils. So we want to make sure we have healthy oils on hand for cooking and for dressings and, and salads. So things like canola oil and olive oil. We want to avoid the oils that have more saturated fat. Things like palm oil, coconut oil, cocoa butter. And you'll see these a lot even in ingredients on food labels. And these are the oils that you definitely want to try to stay away from. And then reduced fat, low fat salad dressings and mayonnaise is even trying to perhaps just use olive oil or canola oil instead of using the, um, you know, the calorie laden dressings that you might be used to. That's a great way to kind of make a healthy replacement. And if possible, try to really be aware of the ingredients you're stocking in your pantry because even if you say, oh, you know what? I'm going to grab this bag of Oreos and kind of keep it on the top shelf and I'll use it as a treat someday. But, you know, when you get into that habit of kind of stocking things that maybe aren't as healthy, it's, it's still there and it's still a temptation of something that, you know, you might not want to include as regularly in your diet. So try to really be aware and mindful of the label reading techniques that we talked about. So even the dry goods, and the non-perishable goods that are in your shelf, in your cabinets, even when you have to go to reach for something. You know, even um, air popped popcorn is a good snack if that's something that you can tolerate. You know, so rather than having a bag of chips or potato chips or something like that, having just, you know, plain popcorn on hand is a good thing, a good healthy snack to have rather than, um, you know, the more calorie laden alternative. Okay, so after we've done our shopping and our planning, and we've come home and we've stocked our refrigerator and, and kind of filled our pantry, what comes next? Well, naturally, cooking. So we're going to take all the ingredients that we purchased and try to cook and prepare a healthy meal. And a lot of times this can be overwhelming for people because, you know, maybe you're not somebody who really, you don't, you don't feel the cooking as your forte or it's not something that interests you that much or perhaps you feel like, Healthy cooking is more time consuming than just kind of cooking something more quick and convenient. So the goal here today is to try to show you that healthy cooking doesn't have to be time consuming. It could be easy. And, and if you're just aware of a few simple techniques, you can really make some big changes um, in trying to prepare more healthful meals. So the first thing you want to remember is some key cooking um, techniques that are healthier. It's always more healthy if you're going to bake, roast, broil, steam, saute, or poach. Frying should be something that you do less often. And of course, we all know frying is not as healthy. Um, definitely adds more calories and you know uses a lot more fat than necessary. The only type of frying that I that you know, it, and it because it has the word frying in it, it shouldn't have a negative connotation. But um, stir frying is usually the quickest method of kind of, let's say, stir frying meat or tofu and vegetables together. And because it's cooked rather quickly, and you don't need that much oil in order to, um, you know, gently sear the vegetables that are in that that kind of process. Stir frying is actually um, the one kind of frying that that you know we do condone. 
So those are the kind of the ones that you want to keep in mind if you're going to try to think of a healthier way to prepare your foods. As we spoke about earlier, when I talked about the importance of kind of adding more plant foods and the American Institute for Cancer Research really emphasizing the importance of a more plant-based diet, we do want to kind of add more plant foods if we can, because these colorful fruits, vegetables, and grains add so many good cancer-fighting properties to our meals and to our cooking. So when possible, you want to limit your cooked portion of meat. You want it to be about three ounces per meal. Okay, so three ounces is going to be about the size of the palm, in your, palm of your hand. Or if you're thinking of you know, a really rough sketch of what your plate looks like, you definitely want about a third or less of your plate to be the animal protein. And you want two thirds or more to be these colorful plant foods. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb when you're thinking about what a healthy meal can look like. The other thing we want to try to do is add new ingredients that are healthier, healthier proportion of, of good cancer-fighting foods in our meal. So let me give you some examples. So oftentimes, you know, summertime, a great thing, you know, people think, oh, I'm going to go out and barbecue, and usually it's a beef burger. But there's some, you know, good healthy alternatives to a beef burger as well. I mean, one thing, and actually, it can be really tasty if you, you know, use it the right way. Instead of using a beef burger, you can actually grill or sear or even roast a portobello mushroom cap. It kind of has a nice shape and fits on a bun really nicely. And it's actually really delicious with a slice of tomato, even some leafy green lettuce. And if you marinate it in a little bit of olive oil and some balsamic vinegar, it's got a nice kind of rich, meaty flavor, but yet it's definitely not even close to the fat content of a beef burger. Even if you're preparing, let's say, a burger that uses beef, what you can do is substitute, obviously, tur ground turkey or chicken. And another option is even using three quarters of a pound instead of a pound. So let's say you're making burgers for the family or a meatloaf. What you can do is actually add two thirds a cup of cooked brown rice, quinoa, or even barley. And that will actually replace the full pound of meat that you were going to use. So use only three quarters of a pound of the meat and add two thirds a cup of the cooked brown rice, quinoa, or barley. And that's a great way to kind of decrease some of the fat content and make that a little bit healthier. And you can do that, like I said, with also the ground turkey and ground chicken. Um, but if you're using ground beef every once in a while, even more important to try that little trick. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to think of color. So when we're thinking of our meals, we want them to have a variety of colors. We want them to have these cancer-fighting phytonutrients that color is equivalent to. So when you're planning your meal, try to always think of your plate having several different colors. So I started to talk about some leaner cooking tips when I discussed the burger idea. Here are some additional cooking tips that can help keep your meals leaner and lower in saturated fat. First off, you always want to replace saturated fat. Saturated fat is going to come from things like butter and hydrogenated things like Crisco, um, you know, things that are basically solid at room temperature. So shortenings, um, butter, the hard, the hard white portions of, um, let's say, a steak or a burger or something like that, the, the, the fat that's trimmable, basically the white part, is going to be your saturated fat. So whenever possible, trim or try to replace that ingredient with a healthier, unsaturated fat. So things like olive and canola oil are much healthier to use in cooking. Even when you're making, let's say, a recipe that calls for butter, you can equally substitute olive or canola oil. And usually it tells you on the package, even in like a cake mix, for example, or a bakery mix, how to substitute a healthy oil for that butter. Even things like soup, a lot of times people may add, let's say, heavy cream to a soup to make like a creamed version. But believe it or not, an easy way to thicken soups is to just puree half of the vegetables in a blender and then stir it right back into the soup. You can even stir in a bit of skim milk or evaporated milk and then totally cut down on any unnecessary fat added to that soup. 
Anytime a recipe calls for sour cream, low-fat yogurt or even non-fat yogurt is a great, great substitute. And even making sandwiches and things that call for mayonnaise, low-fat or non-fat mayonnaise can greatly reduce the fat content as opposed to the alternative full-fat mayonnaise, especially when we're thinking about summertime making healthy salads and pasta salads and things like that is a great way to think about cutting back on unnecessary added fats. So when we're talking about dairy and seasoning and kind of including that into our, our recipes and into our cooking, here are some other ideas that you can keep in mind. Anytime a recipe or egg dish calls for eggs, you can always substitute with egg whites instead of egg yolks. And the actual standard is two egg whites for each egg yolk. So that's kind of a good technique to keep in mind if you wanted to cut down on the fat a little bit. And as I mentioned just before, anytime a recipe calls for a dairy product, try to use either the low-fat or fat-free version of whether it be the milk, the yogurt, or the cheese. Especially the cheese. A lot of times, you know, they make low-fat cheese nowadays that is so tasty and melts really, really nicely. It's not like what you would think that it was maybe 10 years ago, even five years ago. They, you know, the food industry has really made low-fat cheese quite tasty, but yet a lot lower in saturated fat. So it's a great substitute when a recipe calls for cheese. Definitely, if you can, you do want to try to avoid using things that are prepackaged, like seasoning mixes. They often contain a large, large, large amount of sodium. One example would be taco seasoning. You know, that might be a common meal that you include in your weeknights with your family, making, let's say, turkey tacos. Um, but that taco seasoning is going to contain a lot of sodium. There actually um, are online, I have seen, several good recipes for homemade taco seasoning where you can use, you know, your own chili powder and ground cumin and ground coriander and some cilantro, and there's, you know, some great recipes to make your own homemade taco seasoning without any added sodium. If you don't have time to necessarily do that, they do sell low-sodium versions of things like taco seasoning. So whenever you're in that aisle in the supermarket that has kind of prepared mixes, if at all possible, if you can avoid those, that would be great and just kind of use your own great seasoning because those contain a lot of sodium. But if it's something that you, you definitely need to make the food that you're preparing, always choose the lower sodium version. And then when possible, if you can use fresh herbs or dried herbs, that's always preferable because not only do those herbs contain helpful plant chemicals and cancer-fighting phytonutrients, but they're also just healthier for you in general. You can grind herbs with a mortar and pestle, so even just kind of crushing them together and maximizing the freshness and the flavor. Or you can even um, kind of dry them yourself, grind them up. Things like thyme, rosemary, marjoram, they're actually great ways to give dishes really nice flavor. And they're not super pungent, they're not spicy, you know, they're not, they, they, they really mix well with a lot of different kinds of foods. So try to kind of keep your mind open to different spices and herbs that maybe you weren't accustomed to using before. It would be a great way to add more flavor without having to add extra sodium. Vinegar, citrus juices are also really good flavor enhancers to keep in mind. It's just important to remember to use them at the last moment. So for example, vinegar is really great used on vegetables, things like leafy greens. And citrus works well on fruits and things like melon. But just remember, like I said, if you add it too soon, it may not necessarily marry well with the flavor of what you're trying to do. So just be sure to add those flavor enhancers at the last moment. So now that we've talked about some ways where we can replace healthy ingredients in our cooking and ways we can try to kind of cut out some of the unnecessary fat, let's give an example of how we can look at a recipe and try to think of some healthy ideas of ways we can make that recipe healthier. This is a recipe makeover that is often used in, as an example in some of the literature in the American Institute for Cancer Research and some of their cancer-fighting literature and their New American Plate series. So this particular recipe is for Asian chicken stir-fry with broccoli, red peppers, and snow peas. 
So as you can see, the recipe on the left is the original recipe. You'll see, just to point out, there's a pound and a half of boneless, skinless chicken thighs. In the makeover, we actually use two-thirds of a pound of boneless, skinless chicken breasts. So right there you see that we've already used one technique that we talked about earlier. You'll see two tablespoons of soy sauce, whereas in the makeover, you'll see two tablespoons of reduced sodium soy sauce. And you'll also see that the list kind of looks a little bit longer as well. That's because we're adding a little bit more flavor without having to add a lot of sodium. So we're adding a little bit more hoisin sauce and a little bit more chili puree to give it a little bit more flavor without having to add any unnecessary extra soy sauce or ingredients that might make the meal less healthy. You'll also notice that there's some more vegetables added, things like broccoli and snow peas. So when we kind of summarize it on the next slide, this is really a great example of how to kind of reverse the portions of animal protein and add more plant protein, just like we were talking about earlier. That, that new American plate approach is two-thirds two or more of your plant foods and one-third or less of your, your animal protein. So we did a smaller protein of meat. We also did more, um, a, a higher portion of vegetables. So we added more cruciferous broccoli, and we added more snow peas than in the original recipe. The fat added was less than in the typical stir fry. And as I said earlier, because of the method of stir frying, you actually can get away with using a lot less fat than you would think. And if you need to moisten up the food, Rather than adding more oil, you can add more reduced sodium chicken broth to moisten it as you're cooking it. And as I pointed out before, we use lower fat chicken breasts instead of the chicken throat thighs. And then we added more of those intense flavors rather than adding more fat and more sodium from things like soy sauce and, and, and added mixes, added seasoning mixes. So it's not something that's that difficult to do. Like once you get in the habit of kind of getting the feeling of what a healthy recipe and a healthy recipe makeover is going to feel like and look like, you actually can get the swing of it a lot more easily than you would think. And if you kind of take into account what we're talking about tonight and stocking a healthy pantry and shopping and having all the, the ingredients readily available to you, it's actually doable. You can actually make this action plan work for you. So when we talk about cooking, of course we cannot forego some of the essential equipment that we need to make these healthy cooking and these healthy recipes happen. So these are some essential kitchen equipment that you know we usually recommend, and as a dietitian, I usually recommend people have on hand. So things like kitchen scissors, I use kitchen shears all the time for snipping my herbs. It's so much easier than cutting them on a cutting board. All you have to do is roll them up and kind of snip them and chop them into a salad or into a stir fry or into a recipe. They're also really, really useful for cutting up things like dried fruits and even trimming fat from chicken and meats. Most importantly, and a lot of times people don't realize this, it's very important to have two separate cutting boards. You want to have a separate cutting board for meat and vegetables. And the reason for that is you never want to take a chance that there's going to be any cross-contamination of bacteria from meat. Usually I recommend people label a cutting board, or it's, if it's easier for you, you can just buy two different colors and just know, let's say your green cutting board is for your vegetables and your red cutting board is for your meat. Plastic cutting boards are most useful because they can actually be run through the dishwasher. If you have cutting boards that are made of wood, or other materials, they're a little more difficult to sanitize because usually you have to use a bleach solution and scrub them, and it's definitely more labor intensive. A collapsible vegetable steamer, usually it fits in a medium saucepan. That's a really great, 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 great tool to have because you can easily steam vegetables, use them for salads and side dishes, and it's a great way to cook them, maximize the flavor, maximize the nutrition without having to overcook them and kind of leach out any of the nutrients. Obviously a colander is really handy. I use a colander all the time, let's say to rinse beans, rinse vegetables, 
and you know really keep things clean and you could it's really easy to have a colander sitting on the fridge like you can kind of let's say scrub some sweet potatoes put them in the colander drain them and then have them readily available to cook in your recipe or to bake or you know use as needed and then a nonstick pan and nonstick vegetable spray are helpful but I do get a lot of questions about nonstick pans these days simply because a lot of my patients and clients are often concerned about the Teflon and let's say chemicals that are used in nonstick pans. So one thing you can look for is something called a non-PFOA pan. And the PFOA is usually the chemical that's used in the nonstick surface that can potentially have health implications. So they are making more and more brands now that are made, let's say, with ceramic or other coatings that are much, much safer and um, make it easier for you to cook in a nonstick surface and not have to worry about any potential chemicals that may be lingering. Even things like vegetable sprays, some people don't like to use, let's say, the vegetable sprays that come from a can, and that's fine. They sell great um, olive oil sprayers and oil sprayers where you can actually just pump them by hand and then spray the oil yourself and then you don't have to have you know, any kind of um, container of a vegetable spray that may have other additives. Okay, so we've talked about healthy shopping and health, planning your meals and stocking a healthy pantry, but we all know that there are going to be times when we're going to dine out, that we're not going to be cooking at home, we're not going to be taking advantage of the foods that, you know, the healthy foods that we've purchased and that we've worked so hard to plan and prepare. So it's always important that we also have in the back of our minds some healthy techniques on how we can dine out and stay healthy at the same time. So to continue that action plan and to maintain all of the healthy principles that we've been reviewing over our, the course of our webinar series, we want to make sure we can also translate that into being able to dine out healthily as well. So usually the first and foremost thing that I do recommend is to try to avoid restaurants that offer all-you-can-eat buffets or specials because those are places where it's just going to be a, essentially a calorie nightmare. It's going to be way more calories and way more temptation than it, it's pretty much impossible to resist because you're paying for something that's all you can eat and chances are most people are going to go into that scenario and say, well, I want to get my money's worth, so I'm going to go back for the extra portion or I'm going to order the next serving. So if at all possible, definitely try to avoid those, those um, types of restaurants and those types of eating scenarios. It is helpful. If you're someone who tends to dine out with friends, families, loved ones, and you know you really get tempted to have the appetizer, take advantage of the bread and the chips on the table. If you're that type of person, then a good action plan for you would be to have a light snack or beverage before you're dining out, especially if you're going and you're really hungry. It's important. Don't go out starving. And, and a good healthy snack. Think about maybe having a piece of fruit or a low-fat yogurt or a small um, serving of the plain nuts that we talked about earlier, something that's a little bit filling and is not going to make you go and really be tempted to eat any of those unnecessary foods that they serve, appetizers and, and things that they put on the table. Oftentimes, a real tough aspect of dining out is portion control as well, because the portion in a restaurant is usually two to three times the portion that we should actually be eating. So portion control is a huge challenge when we're dining out. So one option is you can think about maybe sharing your entree. So an entree-sized dish, maybe share it with another person that you're dining with. Or perhaps order two smaller items, maybe like two appetizers or an appetizer and half of a sandwich or an appetizer and a soup or you know a salad and an, and a, an appetizer. There's definitely ways you can make it work. If you're really you know, enticed by that entree, maybe, and there's no one else that wants to share it with you, try to have the waiter immediately wrap half of it and take it home. This way you're not tempted to eat more than you need to. And try to enjoy the experience of dining out, enjoy the company, enjoy the environment, the music, the scene, 
you know, just just the the actual social enjoyment of dining out and try to make it less about the food. You know, eat slowly, savor your food, enjoy it, so that maybe there's less of a chance that you're going to overeat and be tempted to eat more of that portion. And one other thing I just want you to keep in mind, a lot of times I have patients who will tell me, well, if I'm going to go out to eat, I just won't eat much that day, and if anything, I'm just going to skip lunch. This way I have extra calories and I can save them all for when I dine out. But oftentimes that in itself is kind of setting you up for failure because even if you plan on skipping a meal before going out to eat, chances are you're going to be more hungry than you even realize and more tempted to eat a lot of the high calorie foods that are offered on your restaurant menu. So just try to plan it and be simple about it and say, I'm going to have a good balanced breakfast, lunch, let's say dinner, whatever, you know, whatever meal you're going out for, have a good balanced plan earlier that day so that you're not as tempted to overeat at the restaurant. So now that we've talked about some ways to kind of plan ahead when you're dining out, well, how do you order a meal that's healthy? So there's some good strategies and good words to look for. First, you want to check the menu for any items that might already be marked healthy because that takes a lot of the guesswork out of you know trying to you know, find a healthy food or a healthy meal on that menu. If at all possible, you want to look for the way foods are cooked. So a lot of times there may be, let's say, a menu item, and it you know it may it may be just a fancy name for that food. Let's say you know pasta a la Sicilia. Let's say. Well, we don't necessarily know. What, it's not a given what's in that type of a, a menu option. So if at all possible, if they have a description, what you want to look for is foods that have things that are more steamed, baked, broiled, roasted, poached, rather than fried. So let's say that pasta dish is made with chicken breast, but it says chicken cutlet. That would be a great opportunity for you to say, well, can you maybe make it grilled chicken rather than a chicken cutlet? And that's a great way to reduce some of the calories. Even things like sauces and gravies and dressings, that's an easy one because that can always you could always ask for that on the side, especially salad dressings. It's a great way to ask for salad dressing on the side so that you can control the portion of the dressing on your salad. A really neat method is just to take your fork dip it in the dressing, and then dip it in your salad. You'll still get plenty of taste of the dressing without having to have the salad doused in it. And as I mentioned earlier, definitely try to avoid this section with cocktails, appetizers, things like bread and butter. Try to just hone in on the menu and try to find the one food that you're going to eat. And salad bars, too, you have to be mindful, because even though salad bars have a healthy connotation, even a salad bar can have a lot of unhealthy options. You know, and if you're loading up on things like macaroni salad, potato salad, they may have roasted nuts, they may have a lot of, you know, like let's say cheeses and things like that. If you're putting a lot of those unnecessary ingredients on your salad rather than more of the vegetables and fruits and leaner foods, that also can add a lot of calories that you don't necessarily need. And no one's to say that we can't go out to eat and enjoy dessert once in a while, but if you're trying to choose a healthier dessert, things like fresh fruit, fruit ices, sorbets, even higher calorie desserts, let's say a chocolate cake or something like that, you can share it with the table so just you know so it's not something that you have to be tempted to eat the whole thing. And it's possible. you know once you get into the habit of looking at the menu a little bit differently and dining out with a little bit more of your health in mind, it actually becomes a really natural proce process each and every time you do it. So here are some words to look for on a menu that will help you to flag some of the healthy foods and make it a little bit easier to spot things that might match your healthy lifestyle. So as I mentioned earlier, you want to look for things that are baked and broiled, uh, broiled, braised, those are all, like actually all of the B words that are good to look for for healthy cooking techniques. Even something that's a consomme is usually made in a broth rather than a heavy sauce. Similarly, something cooked in its own juice rather than a gravy is usually healthier. 
plank or sirloin or leaner cuts of meat, things that say garden fresh or full of vegetables are always a great option, grilled, marinara, poached, as opposed to alfredo and parmigiana and things like that. Even roasted vegetables as opposed to, you know, vegetables that may be doused in, let's say, butter or cheese or sauce. Seared or pan seared is a great thing to look for because it's usually cooked very quickly at high heat, so it's not very lead in, in calories and, and oil. Steamed is always a great option, especially at an Asian restaurant. Rather than having something doused in a heavy sauce, you could actually ask for it steamed instead and ask for the sauce on the side. And of course, of course, as we talked about a few times already, stir fry is also a really good option because it usually means that it's cooked with a smaller amount of oil. So now that we've talked about so many different techniques that can potentially stir your appetite for health and to really you know, kickstart and jumpstart your action plan for healthy living, what are some of the next steps that you can take? We've actually created a resource tip sheet for you. And after the webinar this evening, um, we will actually make that available to you through email, um, likely at some point this week. So it's going to be um, a PDF tip sheet that will have a review of kind of all of the techniques that we've talked about um, over the course of the past two webinars and will include um, some tips on healthy dining out and healthy eating, and will also give you some good internet resources that you can utilize as well. There are some good web-based resources listed in our tip sheet as well. That'll include things like um, calorie and physical activity monitoring and healthy eating for cancer prevention and wellness as well. Outside of the tip sheet, you're also encouraged, if possible, to meet with a local registered dietitian. Because, of course, I've been able to give you a lot of great tips over the course of the past two webinars, but it's most helpful if you have the opportunity to sit down with somebody and make an individualized plan and address your specific nutritional needs. It's really easy to locate a registered dietitian. On our website, which I'll show you on the next slide, the Meals to Heal website, we have access to the Oncology Nutrition Practice Database, where you can find an oncology dietitian in your area. Or if you're looking for a general dietitian, you can also go to the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is really easy to remember. It's eatright.org. And you can also search for a local registered dietitian in your area as well. It is important to, to seek nutrition advice from a registered dietitian as opposed to a nutritionist, because a registered dietitian is somebody who actually has the certification and, and or licensure to practice nutrition, whereas a nutritionist is not a regulated um, credential in any, in any way, shape, or form. So always seek nutrition advice from a registered dietitian. So I do want to thank you for being part of our webinar series. I've really enjoyed sharing all this great information with you all. And I do look forward to, um, to some questions now. You can actually type them in to your chat function on the screen. And Liliana will be able to kind of group the questions together so that we'll be able to answer some of the things that have come up as you've listened to the webinar. And here is our contact information as well. So I look forward to your questions. Jessica, I have a, qu a question here. It's in regards to sugar. Um, and avoiding sugar, um, they find a lot of products containing Splenda. How do you avoid uh, sugars and these products? Um, is there anything better as a substitute? As opposed to Splenda or just in general? Mm -hmm. Well, in general, you know, there's different reasons why people may use, a, let's say, an artificial sweetener. Splenda is generally one that's known to be one of the safer ones as compared to things like acesulfame potassium and aspartame and so forth, you know, they all potentially have been, you know, studied for many, many years and, and have FDA approval, obviously, but really it's an individual choice as to whether or not that's something that you want to include in your diet, and I usually kind of leave it up to the individual as to whether or not it makes sense for you. Um, it's not to say that they're not safe, it's just a matter of it's, if that's something that you want to use, it's an ingredient that's obviously not natural. 
So you could potentially um, think about using a more natural sweetener, something that has more potency um, sweetness to it, something like stevia is actually a natural sweetener that's very, very potent in sweetness, so you don't have to use a lot of it at all, and it comes from a natural leaf, so it's not anything artificial at all. The same thing with, um, you know, let's say using something like honey, honey or agave might be a, a more natural way of adding a sweetener. You'd only have to use a little bit of it, and it's not something that's artificial. So there are kind of healthier techniques to think about, maybe adding things that are more natural, or if you are going to use something that's artificial, just do so in moderation. I wouldn't use all foods that contain artificial sweeteners because that's not necessarily healthy either. Um, but let's say if you're somebody who is more aware because you have, let's say, diabetes or prediabetes, in that case, you might need to use more of those foods and just try to do so in moderation. And if, if at all possible, portion control and just a healthy, good, well-balanced diet is, is always the primary foundation before you would you know, seek to choose and, and, and use a lot of those foods. But that's a good question. Another question is in regards to dairy. Um, what about ovarian cancer patients avoiding dairy? They, there's a lot of studies out there. Um, is that true? Yeah, and that question actually came up a couple of weeks ago as well. So basically, it's it, according to the oncology and nutrition community and the medical community, although there's been some research out there, there isn't enough for us to have a consensus at this point. So it's not something that we absolutely say that you have to avoid. We continue to recommend that if you do have dairy foods, you do so in the right balance. Usually two to three servings is about the amount that anyone would really ever need. Um, and if, if at all possible, if you're somebody who is concerned in any way, shape, or form, you can talk to your medical team and your specific nutritionist about your individual case because there are lots of other great substitutes as well if that's something you feel more comfortable with and it makes sense for you and your medical history and your lifestyle. But it's really not necessarily the dairy itself that's particularly been linked in any way, shape, or form. Some of the things that have been studied are the type of carbohydrate, the type of sugar that's in the dairy foods. Um, and it's also, like I said, the amount, the quantity that people are eating, let's say, in their daily diet. So um, I would say as long as you're trying to use low-fat or non-fat dairy products, that's of utmost importance no matter what because you don't need the extra saturated fat. And we know that the extra saturated fat is not healthful. And then if you're still questioning whether or not it makes sense for you, like I said, A, speak to your medical team. But there really is no um, conclusive consensus that it has to be avoided at this point. I would say just include it in moderation and in balance with the rest of your diet if it's something that you do include because you don't necessarily need more than two or three servings per day depending on your calcium needs. And there are acceptable substitutes if you're somebody who is choosing to include, let's say, soy milk or rice milk or almond milk and things like that. Here's another question. Do you recommend organic fruits and vegetables over conventional? That's a great question. Um, believe it or not, you know, there, there have been a lot of studies looking at conventional produce versus organic produce. And we know that in the large, large studies looking at cancer prevention that fruits and vegetables are beneficial whether they're organic or not. Um, and simply because they have so many important cancer-fighting ingredients. So it really comes to a matter of kind of personal preference and what makes the most sense for you. So a lot of times organic, although nowadays it's becoming more mainstream, organic can be more expensive. So not, you know, not everybody can afford to buy organic fruits and vegetables. And, and that's okay in itself because, like I said, we would rather you eat fruits and vegetables even if they're not organic because they're so, so important in a cancer-fighting diet. If you can't afford to choose, let's say, some organic, a great reference point would be the Environmental Working Group. I think their website is ewg.org. They have a list of the dirty dozen, let's say the top 12 fruits and vegetables that have more of a chance of being contaminated. And they also list the Clean 15, which are the 15 cleanest most fruits and vegetables that you can feel comfortable, let's say, you know, okay, these I don't necessarily need to worry so much about choosing organic. So that's a great starting point, um, but definitely a really good question, and it's a common question that comes up. But like I said, the most important thing, 
is that fruits and vegetables are so important to eat, whether they're organic or not. And that's the, the most important place to start. Another question is, um, is it true that foods like cayenne pepper, ginger, or garlic are rich in cancer-fighting agents? Can you just repeat the foods again? Cayenne pepper, ginger, or garlic are rich in cancer-fighting agents? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, as I mentioned, like a lot of the herbs and spices that we use, are also plant foods. So these herbs and spices also contain health, really healthy cancer-fighting plant chemicals or phytonutrients that are helpful in, in, to incorporate into a cancer-fighting diet. So absolutely, even though garlic is a white food, it's still considered a color. It's a color that we consider as part of the spectrum of, of um, colors that you want to include in your variety of, of fruits and vegetables. And the same thing with things like ginger, absolutely. Ginger is a great, great addition if you can use it, let's say, ground up in a stir fry or in a soup or making ginger tea. Or um, We even have a great recipe on our website that has a, it's a ginger granita kind of for summertime. So ginger is a great food to include as well and has lots of anti-inflammatory properties as well as anti-nausea properties. And then same thing with cayenne pepper is known to reduce inflammation. Um, of course, not everybody can tolerate the spiciness of it, but for certain, if you're including that in your variety of flavorings and spices, those are all really great things to include. And I was just thinking, too, if you'd like, um, for the person who did ask the organic question, what I can do is I will um, I'll forward the link to the environmental working groups list of the dirty dozen and the clean 15. So I'll forward the link on to Liliana so that with the information that will be emailed out to you along with the resource list, you can also have the link to that if you need it. Jessica, that was the last question I had. Are there any other questions? Uh, one more question. Is organic coconut oil okay to use? Organic coconut oil. Well, coconut oil does contain more saturated fat. So I'm not sure, you know, if you're using it, like in, in what sense you're using it. Um, the healthier fats to use are definitely the olive and canola oil that I mentioned. Those have the best profile in terms of, of the, the ratio of healthy fats. So um, obviously coconut in itself is, is a plant food and it's healthy, but the coconut oil in itself is, is known to have a little more saturated fat. So, you know, if, if, it, if a recipe calls for it and it, it has to be something that's a coconut oil because of the flavor or whatnot, I would say, you know, try to use, you know, just a minimal amount, um, you know, if it's just that particular recipe or, you know, if it's something that you're using more regularly, try to su substitute it with a healthier fat if possible. Does anyone have any more questions? Um, one more question, Jessica. Is it better to choose grass-fed beef? Well, that's a really good question. That's something that's, come, that's become more popular in the past few years. And the reason why grass-fed beef is touted to be a little bit healthier is because of the way the cows are fed. Obviously, they're grass-fed, so they're not fed the same kind of diet that a regular cow is. And the reason for that is it's pretty much being fed vegetarian. So essentially, a grass-fed beef should have a healthier fat profile as opposed to regular beef. So Yes, it's healthier, but it's not an absolute requirement because, of course, we're encouraging that you don't you limit your red meat to begin with and not eat as, as often. So, if if you could only afford regular beef as opposed to grass-fed beef, you know the trade-off is is that you're just having it less often to begin with, or you know kind of trimming it down from your diet. But 
if you can afford it, it's definitely a healthier option because the way the cows are fed essentially makes the quality, um, the, the, the quality and the nutrient value in terms of the fat content of that beef definitely makes it healthier. Another question on that vein is how safe is turkey bacon and turkey sausage? So turkey bacon and turkey sausage are obviously made with turkey, which is a little bit leaner than their, their beef and pork counterparts. But what you do want to remember is that there's still it's still bacon and it's still sausage. So even though it's a turkey version, it's still going to have more fat than using something leaner or potentially just using it more sparingly, and it's also going to ha still have more sodium. You know, it, it's still a sausage, even though it's a turkey sausage. So it's it's a food that should be more of a sometimes food rather than something you're using more regularly. It is lower in, in saturated fat, but it still does contain fat and sodium. That's not necessarily something you need to include regularly as part of a breakfast. Thanks. And the last question is, how important is it to eat grain? How, I missed the last part. How important, how is, important it to, is it to eat grain? Yeah, I'm still not understanding it. How, how, is it, in, in, is it, how important is it to eat grain? Eat grain? grains? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Eat grains. Yeah, grains, a variety of grains are very important because Ideally, you know, our bodies need a good portion of our diet should come from carbohydrate-containing foods because those are the foods that give our body energy, right? So we don't want it to be from refined carbohydrates, things like white rice and white breads and white pastas because those don't have the added benefit of that whole grain. So a variety of whole grains, things like bran and brown rice and bulgur and quinoa and millet and couscous, all different kinds of grains actually give us a variety of different kind of plant nutrients, those phytonutrients, because they're all essentially good plant foods that have a lot of good healthful properties, but they also give us good dietary fiber that the refined grains don't give us. And the reason for that is because they're not, they're not polished, so the, the grain is whole. It's not the, the outer part and the healthful part of the grain where all the nutrients are is not removed in the, the food processing. So it's important to try to use a variety of grains and not just stick to the same old, let's say, whole wheat pasta and brown rice, and to think outside the box a little bit because those other grains are also giving you a good variety of nutrients and, and cancer-fighting plant chemicals as well. Great. Uh, the question was, and uh, someone clarified the question, it is, um, the question is about whole, isn't about whole versus refined grains, but grains versus vegetables. Oh, okay. Okay, good. I'm glad you clarified then, because I definitely want to make sure to answer your question. So you want to, you want to have a balance of both. Essentially, um, both grains and plant foods like fruits and vegetables are all considered, um, you know, good parts of a plant-based diet. But when we think of kind of the balance of our diet, obviously we want to include, if you think of like what a, a plate, like a good example would be to think of your plate. You would want, obviously like we said, we want two-thirds of our plate to be plant foods and one-third or less to be the protein. So that two-thirds, you would want approximately about a fistful. One serving would be your grain, and then you'd have two servings of, let's say, uh, different kinds of vegetables or a fruit and a vegetable. So if you think about approximately like serving size of a grain, you'd think of approximately the size of a fist or a baseball is a good rule of thumb when you're thinking about what, what portion, a portion of pasta or a portion of rice or like a baked potato should look like on your plate as opposed to the fruits and vegetables are generally lower in calories depending on how we're preparing them, obviously. If we add a lot of oil and things like that, they're not. But as the food in itself, those are a lot lower in calories, and we can usually have more room for those foods as opposed to overdoing it on our grains. Even though grains are so healthy and full of fiber, you still want to be aware to have the right portion size. Thank you all for the great questions.
And if you think of any more, you're welcome to forward them along to Liliana, and I'd be happy to answer them after the fact as well. Great. Well, thank you, Jessica, for um, this incredible webinar and educational information. We're very excited um, that you were able to do this two-part webinar series, Nutrition on the Fast Track. I also want to thank the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, Meals to Heal, and Genentech. And um, you will be receiving an email after the webinar with the link. This webinar has been recorded. And later on in the week, you'll be receiving a recap that will have part one and part two, plus the handout sheets. Thank you very much, and have a good evening.